But this is a wonderful thing. Took me a few weeks to figure out. Uh, dill hijacking. There's two things, dill hijacking and dill proxying. I'll talk more about the dill hijacking, but the dill proxying is the stronger attack. And uh, installing Visual Studio is what you'll need to do dill proxying, but you don't have to do it on these cloud machines because it's already installed. So here's dill hijacking. And I'm going to go to my Windows machine. We pretty much be using the Windows machine for everything here. Because what we're looking at is Windows internals. And there, that looks pretty good. And let me just get the instructions inside here because there are some long command line commands. And it's much better to copy, copy and paste them than try to type them out. All right. And we're using these machines, which are better than the Flare VM for what we're doing. And they already have Metasploit installed. So the first thing we're going to do is make some malware. So we open the command prompt. This is one of the several reasons why we have Windows Defender turned off in here, because it would stop us from doing a lot of nasty things we're going to do. And the command is here. See Metasploit framework and all that jazz. But I have to be in the downloads folder. So to get there, I have to change directory to users, i.e. user, downloads. All right. If I do a directory, I've got a few things in my downloads folder. All right. But when I do this command here, this is going to run MSF Venom, which is the Metasploit framework is an open source pen testing tool. And MSF Venom is the tool that creates malware. So this is going to create a piece of malware that's a library, shellbind.dil. And what it's going to do is run a Windows shellbind TCP, which will just start listening on port 4444. And anybody that connects to that port will be able to control your machine. It's a very simple attack. And not a very powerful one, actually, because um, if you're running any firewalls on your network, they'll block unexpected connections to a port like that. Now, it doesn't seem to be listening when I press Enter. There, it finally got through. All right. Had to use the other Enter key on my keyboard, which is a little screwy, but there's always these little things when running these virtual machines. All right, so there it goes. Uh, some message about Ruby. My Metasploit is in Ruby. Now some warning that something is deprecated. That's normal. And it's done. It has created a DIL, 8,700 bytes long. If I do a dir, it will show, here is my shellbind.dil. So I now have a library that will do something malicious, but I have to trick some executable into running that library. And what we're going to do is um, mess with the MSDTC service. But you have to turn off the firewall. If you don't turn off the firewall, it won't work. So Windows Defender Firewall. It's already off. Red and red means it's off. That's good. OK. So now I want to look at the MSDTC service. And here, let me close these putties. I'm not using putty now. And. OK. Uh, in Services, OK. Distributed Transaction. Services. All right, these are the same services we saw in Process Explorer that are running in the background, doing all sorts of things on your machine. And a lot of these are not important. A lot of them are sort of useless appendices from other versions of Windows that you're not using. And one of them is this Distributed Transaction Coordinator. This is something about databases, and it's not even running right now. See, some of them are running. Some of them haven't even started. This would not be used unless we were um, running some kind of database on the system, I think. So uh, if we go to the properties of this, right-click Properties, like most services, it has to log on with a special account, not your logon account, because this launches before you log in. And I'm going to change it to Local System Account, which is what many services are. Uh, we could leave it at network service for all that, but I've just got used to doing it this way in the project. Make it local system account. 
So this will now launch as system. And what we want to do is watch how it launches, and we're going to monitor it with Process Monitor, which is the next sysinternals tool to learn about. And this is extremely powerful and uh, makes it, uh, you can find a lot of serious bugs in software just by watching how they launch. So we launch Process Monitor, P-R-O-C-M-O-N, and there it is, the 64-bit version. And it matters whether you run it as administrator. It's better not to run it as administrator. Oh, I guess it's going to change anyway. All right. Uh, we'll see how this works. There is an issue about the administrator privileges that will come up a little later. And now let me make my font bigger, uh, which is options font, perhaps. Options font. Uh, all right. Okay, and now I think if I stop it and start, actually it looks like this is good enough. Sometimes it doesn't make the vertical distance big enough between the lines, but it looks pretty good. All right, so here's processes. So what's going on? This is actually just a view into the Windows system logs, which you would see in Event Viewer. And you see an incredible number of them, 337,000 events. So this is nuts way too much information. So I can you stop and start sniffing with this third button. I'm going to stop sniffing and clear the old stuff. And I need to have filters so I don't just see everything. And the filters are in the instructions there. So here is filters, I think. Yep. So I'm going to make filters to match that. What I want to do is just find out what's going on with this distributed transaction coordinator thing and how it loads libraries. So I want the process name to contain msdtc, all right, and add that one. And I want the path of executables it refers to to end with dill, dot dll. So all I'm going to do is see, uh, I'm intended to add it, so yes. All right, so now, now when I start sniffing, it's filtering all the events, so it's not wasting my time on them. And now I can start that uh, this thing here, Distributed Transaction Coordinator. So I start it, and it starts. So now I go back to Process Monitor. There we are. Whoops, it's a little bit slow. All right. And I'm going to stop sniffing because I'm done. And I can now see how it loaded that process. So here we go. Let me uh, try and adjust these column widths for the maximum value. OK, there we go. All right, so here's the result success. Here's the path as it loads various dills. So I'm just going to go through a few pages of this and see what's happening. Um, file locked. That's All right, there we go. All right, so success. It's loading all these dills from C Windows System 32. And file locked and success seem to be common issues. And if I keep going down, I'll eventually see one that was not found. Their name not found, something called Edge GDI. That's interesting. That's one possible entry point. I'm just going to use a different one. There's another one that's the same, file not found. There it is. This is the one I want to use, oci.dil, name not found. So notice what happened. It tried to load this library. It didn't find it, and it just went on. It didn't hunt somewhere else and find it. It just gave up and kept going. Now this is kind of screwy, because the process started. The process is running. It's running just fine. So how come it runs if one of the libraries it needs did not load? The answer is, the developer put in an include file to include this library, but then they never actually used any functions in that library. And this happens all the time. Uh, if you maintain software and you go through various versions and include modules, that you include a library somewhere, but whatever part of the code uses that library is removed. So this is a library load which is never actually used, and it doesn't even matter whether it loads or not. So if I put my malware in this location, 
This process will just load my malicious library, and it won't notice that my malicious library doesn't in fact have any functions that are worth anything. So all I have to do is put that malware in this location, C Windows System 32 OCI.dil, and this process will load it. So going back to my instructions, um, that's all you got to do. Uh, you can, by the way, if you can view the service in Process Explorer, I don't think I'll bother, but if you do, you'll see that it does not have the OCI.dil library loaded. It can't. There is no OCI.dil library anymore in Windows 10. But this program doesn't know it, and it's a Microsoft product. You know, it's it's got a little defect which Microsoft didn't fix. So, in the administrator command prompt, we can execute these two commands to put our malware where that uh, the library should be. So, let's see. It's not the copy and paste is failing, which we're all getting kind of used to. Uh, I'm waiting for a little bit of lag. Okay, so it seems like doing it twice helps. Yep, so that stops the process. And then it copies my shell bind malware onto that location, oci.dil. And it's done copying it. So now, that's it. Now all I have to do is um, relaunch it, and it will run the malware. But I'm going to restart Process Monitor to see what it looks like. So I will just uh, clear the old stuff with the trash can and start sniffing again with this square thing. OK. And now restart it with um, net start. I could do it in the GUI tool, too, but this works. Net start msdtc. And notice it starts. And when it starts, it never gets to finish starting because something's wrong with that fake library. But it doesn't complain exactly. It just sort of pauses. And if I go to Process Monitor and stop it, I will find that it did load the DIL, I think. Let me take a look at my instructions. Yeah, here I just, um, in the detail, right, there's just a flag to show how. You'll find, of course, that it did load the DIL. And now, just to prove that it's working, I'm, this administrator command prompt is busy. I'm going to open another command prompt which does not need to be administrator, and do netstat minus an pipe more. And I now have a process listening on port 4444, which is the default for Metasploit. So I can actually connect to that. I could connect to it from any machine on the network, but I can connect locally with NCAT 12701 4444. And now I'm in, and I can tell I'm in a different place because if I do who am I, I'm now system, which is bigger than it, the more powerful than administrator. I'm now going through a shell that's launching as that system process. So that is DIL hijacking. Now, I got complaints last time I taught this from a pen tester in the group saying, wait a minute, you had to be the administrator to do that, so you didn't actually accomplish anything. And that is true. This shows you the process, but it doesn't actually do anything you couldn't do anyway since you're already the administrator on this machine. And that's why um, the next project is the one where you do the more powerful attack. See, this one you see how you could replace a DIL with a malicious DIL, and it'll just cheerfully load it and not care that it's not signed or anything, and that's fine. But the problem is, if you go to uh, the next project, which is DIL proxying, 126. If you try doing that with another program, a BG Info, for example, it won't fall for it. If you try to replace a library that is actually used, then these fake libraries from uh, Metasploit will not pass the test because they don't have the functions you need. So to fix that, you have to do DIL proxying, and that's what you do here. You need Visual Studio, which is already installed, and so you can't just make a malicious DIL with Metasploit this way because this DIL does not export any functions. It doesn't have any actual valuable functionality. It's just 100% malware. And when you load the DIL main, which is the executable part of it that runs when you first load a DIL, that does the malicious thing, and that's it. Um, so if you want to fool, a, and the program will not be fooled by that. The application was unable to start correctly. So to fix that, you have to make a DIL proxy. You get DIL export viewer, 
and you dump the exports from the real program. We're, we're going to replace Microsoft's real version.dil with a proxy. It has about 20 functions that it has. So you have to export those functions and you have to build the dil in um, Visual Studio. And so you um, make this, here's the pragma comment linkers. These will take all those function calls and it will export them so that your, um, your new malicious dil appears to provide those functions and it will just proxy them to version.orig. So we'll make a copy of the real Microsoft dil, put a dil in version.dil in the path, and it will then proxy all the calls to this other original dil so that it will have all the functionality of the original dil plus malicious functions here with this exploit function where it runs a payload.bat in addition to providing all the expected functionality. That is a counterfeit dil called a dil proxy and you can build them in Visual Studio and the instructions are here to show you and that is good enough to fool uh, modern utilities and we're going to fool the BG info which is a Microsoft um, sys internals tool just like we fooled the Microsoft uh, sys in, um, transaction coordinator it will load the dil proxy it will accept it it will run fine and it will also do the extra malicious activity which in this case just puts a file on the desktop to prove you can do it that's the full interesting dil proxying exploit which is very nice and it shows you some serious weaknesses in the Microsoft operating system around these libraries which is a real sore point. So if you watch with process monitor what happens when you launch a file you will often find weak spots where it goes to foolish places like loads things from the desktop that really ought to come from a privileged folder and so on. This one lets you put content in a low privileged place like the desktop and it then it loads into a process so you could use this for privilege escalation or other attacks. All right.